This is the day the Lord has made. Welcome to this uh, second worship service of our residential courses this August. Let us uh, rise to worship God together. In the beginning, God created all things. At our beginning, God created us, knitting us fearfully and wonderfully in our mother's wombs and looking upon what God had made. In the work of redemption, through the cross of Jesus Christ and the power of the Spirit, God restores all that was made ugly by sin, making all things new. And one day, God will again look upon God's world and say, Lord God, King of creation, open our eyes to see you, stir our hearts to love you, bend our wills to follow you, now and forever. Amen. build a house where love can dwell and all can safely live a place where saints and children tell how hearts learn to forgive built of hopes and dreams and visions rock of faith and vault of grace hear the love of christ shall end divisions all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome in this place let us build a house where prophets speak and words are strong and true where all god's children dare to seek to dream god's reign anew hear the cross now stand as witness and a symbol of god's grace here as one we claim the faith of jesus all are welcome all are welcome all are welcome in this place let us build a house where love is found in water, wine, and wheat. A banquet hall on holy ground where peace and justice meet. Hear the love of God through Jesus is revealed in time and space as we share in Christ the feast that frees us. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where hands will reach beyond the wood and stone to heal and strengthen, serve and teach and live the word they've known. Hear the outcast and the stranger bear the image of God's face. Let us bring an end to fear and danger. All are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Let us build a house where all are named, their songs and visions heard, and love and treasure taught and claimed as words within the word. 
built of tears and cries and laughter, prayers of faith and songs of grace. Let this house proclaim from floor to rafter, all are welcome, all are welcome, all are welcome in this place. Well, it is so good to be with you all today. I have been waiting 365 days for this moment. That's a lot of delayed gratification, even for an adult. So thank you for your warm welcome this morning, and I'm glad to be with you. You can be seated. As we go to the Word of God, uh, let us join together in prayer. Everlasting God, whose tenacious love holds us, make our hearts the house of your truth and make our minds the realm of your wisdom so that our fellowship will become your dwelling place. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, when Dr. Heisinger invited me to come and give the Warren Lecture and uh, speak in chapel this morning, I had a whole slew of texts and possible sermons, some written and some not yet written, that came to mind that I thought would be fantastic for this occasion. But I couldn't shake the feeling that I was supposed to preach on this text, Genesis 3, this morning. And so I submitted to that impulse inside of me, that um, nudging inside of me. But then I had to submit my title to Jill. <laughs> and a nervousness kind of came over me. I was like, what am I thinking? Who guests, guest preaches on Genesis 3? Well, let's see uh, if we can unpack this text together. We're going to pick up the reading, actually, at verse 14. Adam and Eve have eaten of the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God had told Adam not to eat from. And in their disobedience, the eyes of Adam and Eve were opened, and they felt shame for the first time. So they go and hide from God who is walking in the garden. And God calls them out of hiding for a terribly uncomfortable and hard conversation. And Adam and Eve admit, albeit reluctantly, to their wrongdoing. And then God addresses each of them separately, starting with the serpent, and then the woman, and then the man to identify the consequences of their sin. And this is where we pick up the text. Listen for the word of the Lord. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat and all the days, all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers, and he will strike your head and you will strike his heel. And then to the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pains in childbearing and pain. You shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. And by the sweat of your face you shall eat bread until you return to the ground for out of it you were taken. You are dust, and to dust you shall return. 
And the man named his wife Eve because she was the mother of all who live. And the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and his wife and clothed them. This is the word of the Lord. We have a habit in our family of reading the Bible together after dinner. And often we ask one of our teenage daughters to read the scripture. So the other night, my husband pulls out the Bible and opens it to 1 Peter 3, uh, which was where we had left off the previous night. And he passes the Bible to my oldest daughter, Kaya. Now, Kaya took one look at the beginning of the chapter and blurted out, I'm not reading that. <laughs> and pass the Bible to me. <laughs> now, for those of you who don't know, uh, 1 Peter 3 begins with, wives, submit yourselves to your husbands, and then later on it goes on to describe the wives as the weaker partner. Now, my daughter is not a feminist of any stripe. She doesn't much concern herself with issues of gender equality. She mostly leaves that to me. But in this moment, I could actually see the confusion and dismay on her face, which said, seriously, this is in the Bible? Do we believe this? Is this really what Christians believe? That women are the weaker or inferior sex? That men bear divinely ordained authority and headship to which women must submit? That women are to be subordinate to men simply because, well, they're women and not men? Is this really what God intended for male-female relationships? Many in Christian history and even today would argue that yes, this is indeed what the Bible teaches and what God intended. Male headship and female submission has long been practiced in Christian orthodoxy and this, some would say, is because this is the word of God. For the church to now say and do otherwise just because of changing cultural perspectives about women and men is to stray from the word and will of God. It is to forsake our calling as Christians to be separate from the world, or so the argument goes. But what if this isn't God's will? What if God never intended for such disparity in power and privilege between women and men? What if the church got it wrong. Now, I'm not bold enough to ask that question. <laughs> what if the church got it wrong? But a 19th century preacher, teacher, evangelist, and mother of the Salvation Army, Catherine Booth, was. In her defense of women preaching, Booth considers the question of whether women, uh, the church might be wrong in its views about women, especially in not allowing women to preach. What if the church got the message about what it means to be male and female wrong? What if Genesis 3 and similar texts are not outlining God's will for men and women but rather explaining and describing a disordered world, a world that God grieves. What if patriarchy and complementarianism and whatever other ways the dominance of one person over another is socially and theologically legitimized is actually a reflection of sin? What if God's word for us in this text is not and never was meant to suggest that men should rule over women? What if instead the point of this text is to identify and name and acknowledge that things are not the way they are supposed to be, that sin has actually infected and disrupted every part of our lives, even and perhaps most especially the way we structure our relationships with others. 
And what if this passage is to alert us to the fact that sin is hard at work, constantly threatening to unravel what is good between women and men? By nurturing ungodly desires for dominance and control. And what if this text, in addition to showing us what sin looks like, intends to show us what God's grace looks like in this moment, describing a God who has not left us in a, this tattered state, that in the midst of all that is hard and broken in this world, God is here calling to us, not walking away or giving up on his disordered world, but rather holding us in his care. And what if the care that God expressed in the garden to Adam and Eve by picking up the needle and the thread to sew some garments for his beloved children was just the beginning of God's mercy to us? What if God so loved the world that he gave his only son to take all our brokenness and our sin and our shame and our attempts to dominate and limit and diminish each other and took all that with him to the cross? And what if now God wants to clothe us not only with garments that cover our physical selves, but also to clothe us with the righteousness of Christ so that we are no longer driven by our sinful nature, but live out who we are in Jesus Christ. And what if in this disordered world where gender disparity persists, where women are fined for trying to cover up their bodies while playing sports, but expelled if they show, show their shoulders in school, where 42% of women experience gender discrimination in the workplace, where women earn 84 cents to every dollar a man makes for work of equal value, where one of three women out of every three women report having been sexually harassed at work, where justice and accountability and care for women who have been sexually assaulted and abused or bullied too often takes the back seat to protecting the reputations of institutions and their leaders. What if in this context, in the context of that world that I just described, that is our world, God invites his people to lean into and embrace a new vision for women and men, rooted in their identity in Christ, one in which there is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ. What if, in the context of this world, the church became a beacon of a different way of being community, a community that demonstrates the redemptive power of the gospel by honoring and protecting the value and dignity of each person, women along with men, a community that is not characterized by power or dominance or privilege based on gender, but by mutuality and love and respect. A community where women are invited to share all their gifts in the body of Christ without fear of being demeaned or treated as less than because they are women. A community that rather than remaining silent, grieves and speaks against the disparities and mistreatment of women in the larger culture because they know that this grieves God. A community that provides opportunities for support and encouragement and care for women who have experienced hurt upon hurt and hardship upon hardship that this world heaps on them just because they are women? What if the church became a balm for both women and men, a reprieve from a gendered world that so fundamentally shapes the experiences and well-being of women and men around gender? A community where we are first and foremost children of God, knit 
by God in our mother's wombs, a community characterized by curiosity rather than conquest, where we greet and receive each other with wonder and awe at who God created each person to be and delight in the gift that they are and the gifts that they bring to the community. And what if, and this is my last what if, what if the church began to live into this vision for women and men so well that when our daughters and sons came across texts like 1 Peter 3 and Genesis 3, they don't wonder if this is what we believe. But read these texts as a reminder and an encouragement that along with all the other broken parts of our world and our lives, the structure of our relationships, particularly as male and female, is an area that continues to need our attention and care, and an area that God seeks to redeem through the cross of Jesus Christ. What if we looked instead of to Genesis 3 uh, to define gender relations and gender ideology to Genesis 1 to shape our imaginations for being male and female, for being human. For in the beginning, God created humankind. In his image, God created them. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. And God said to them both, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth and support each other and share with each other and celebrate each other and make space for each other and care for each other. And God saw everything that he had made. And behold, it was very good. Amen. Let us pray in response to the words that we have heard. In peace, we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work, for our families, friends, and neighbors, and for those who are alone. For this community, the nation, and the world. For all who work for justice, freedom, and peace. for the just and proper use of your creation, for the victims of hunger, fear, injustice, and oppression. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble, for those who minister to the sick, the friendless, and the needy. For the peace and unity of the Church of God, for all who proclaim the gospel and all who seek the Church. 
for the special needs and concerns of your people right here. Hear us, Lord, for your mercy is great. Let us sing together. receive God's parting blessing. May God go before you to lead you. May God go behind you to protect you. May God go beneath you to support you. May God go beside you to befriend you. Do not be afraid. And may the triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit bless and sustain you do not be afraid. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Amen. <laughs>